How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm Ashton Goggins, the Editor-in-Chief of STAB, and for the last year, the host of Red Bull's No Contest. Uh, we're going to do a welcome to our watch party. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we're going to go through the last five seasons, a uh, highlight reel from uh, our behind-the-scenes series of the World Tour. We've got three-time world champ Mick Fanning and Nathan Florence on the line. Nathan was the star of our Tahiti episode last year. And Mick has been a uh, recurring guest on No Contest since its very inception. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Mick and Nathan, tell weird. us where you are. <laughs> <laughs> tell us where you are and how long you've been locked down. <laughs> Go Am I starting? Okay, yeah, um, I'm in Hawaii. We've uh, been in quarantine, but Hawaii is probably the most mellowly locked down place. The ocean's open, the beaches are open, we can surf and stuff. So pretty much the most fortunate place to be locked down in this whole thing, I think. So we got super lucky with that. I think it's been a running argument whether Hawaii or Australia was the better place to be locked down right now for about the last <laughs> yeah. month. They've had Nick, better last year in lockdown. Um, I'm actually in, yeah, just at home on the Gold Coast. Um, we're, we're pretty similar to with Nate. Um, beaches have been open to surf. Um, you're allowed to go and exercise on the beach, go walk on the beach. But um, the moment you put a towel down and the cops see you, $1,000 fine on the spot, which is, which is all good. Um, but, yeah, look, not too much has changed in my world. It's sort of just not going to restaurants for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I've been cooking at home a lot. And, yeah, been fun, actually. So this first episode of this season that we just dropped, uh, you feature prominently in it. You were just coming back from uh, a pretty gnarly knee injury. Uh, actually, I realize now that it was on this board. <laughs> this yeah. is the fateful time behind me. <laughs> Has someone been riding? Right Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch it. It's cursed. You timed your return to form pretty uh, nicely with that run of swell. Yeah, look, I, I probably, I just started surfing before the swell before. It was the Kira one, the Dirty Water Kira swell. Um, but I don't think I was ready to put myself in a Kira and, and luckily I had to go away. I did a shark documentary and I was away at that time. And, um, yeah, so once I got back for snapper, it was still terrifying. Um, and yeah, just all came together sort of, I sort of lucked out that it was so perfect. Um, if you guys, uh, so for people watching, if you guys have questions for Mick or Nate or I, you guys can uh, write them in the comment section below on the YouTube link or on Facebook. Uh, we have a, uh, a comment, a very first comment from, I don't know how to say this in Portuguese, Sensational in Brazil, who says that he got his first barrel the other day and he dedicated it to Nathan, which is very sweet. Yes. <laughs> I'm so honored. Thank you, man. Keep it up. <laughs> Uh, and, Beautiful. And then, Nick, is it possible for you to uh, turn your screen a bit so the light through the window comes through a little bit less? So maybe turn it to like a little the other way. Yeah, there we go. Does that work? <laughs> oh, this is going to be hard. You have to oh, cut your trophies out, Nick. We're sorry. <laughs> Shit. Oh, there's more. <laughs> oh, there's more. It's I'm, I'm trying to, I've been doing so many of these. I have to get a new, um, have to get a new background for everyone. Every different uh, interview I'm doing. So you put so new trophies you guys up get my surfboards. One? Yeah. Yeah. I, got, I went over to Parker, stole some of his. Um, yes. uh, <laughs> and now I'm all tied up. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Look at your setup, Nick. So just in, in case anybody's living under a rock, Mick has suddenly become a prolific podcaster and host. Uh, he's been doing a show with Stab Sam McIntosh called Unplugged that Nathan's brother, John, who you might know, was on last episode, and they're going to have Gay Medina on next week. Uh, it's, uh, I feel like you've been pretty productive under the circumstances, Mick. 
Mate, I've been so busy. It's been crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is like my 15th interview this morning. Uh, <laughs> <It's> insane. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it's been fun. I, I really enjoyed um, doing the, the podcast with Sam. It's been, I guess for me, because I'm not a journalist, I'm sort of coming at the athlete's point of view. So I can sort of relay a little bit of what the athlete's feeling and sort of bring up a little bit of different stuff so uh, hopefully people are enjoying them. If not, just tell me and I'm happy to quit at any time. <laughs> I, I just love watching them because it's, it's very easy to see when the surfers forget that they're uh, not talking to a journalist and talking to you. And it, they're, they're much more candid and easygoing in, in the conversation. It's pretty great. Yeah, that was, that was the whole gist of it. You know, I was talking to Sam and I was like, there's so many different stories that you might miss. Um, that guys will share. And so that, that was the whole plan behind the whole podcast, just getting a different look at the surfers and sort of more of a personal, um, personal look into what their brain's thinking at certain times through their career. Um, well, I think we're gonna get into these highlight reels from each of the tour stops and from the last couple of years of episodes. Um, so last year, this Gold Coast episode was my first episode, and Nick was nice enough to uh, play local guy. Uh, we went and surfed a little wedge across from D-Ball with him and Schilling and Matt Biolas on soft tops. And uh, yeah, here's no contest Gold Coast. The waves pumped again before before the event, didn't it? Oh yeah, last year, I feel like it's every year nowadays. So this was Parko's retirement party, is that right? No, that was Taj's retirement party. Taj's retirement Parker party. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> well, on Fiji, Parko actually hurt his knee and flew home. And uh, he flew back because he was had the worst FOMO. <laughs> he flew back for the party. Wow. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> what a legend. I think your retirement party is in this uh, little highlight reel, Nick. The, little, the golf session, the dinner. There's the quiver there, boys. There it is. Ever need Tell some? Tell us about the MS soft top. Mate, um, just, it was just an idea that um, got brought to me and I rode the boards and they actually worked pretty good. Um, that one that I'm trialing there was, yeah, look, I'm ripping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it um, yeah, it was just it's just a fun thing, and it was sort of more just trying to make them a little bit more on the sense of being able to turn, being able to ride them, so people can take their their kids down, push them in on the soft top, but then they don't have to take down six boards, and they can just jump out on one of those and have a uh, a good surf and less hassle. Snapper rocks off. Uh, Red Bull Airborne is about to run a journey. That session was fun. I feel like that was uh, the end of your parenting and training with Jet Schilling last year. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so Jet, Jet's a legend. How good is he? He's uh, so funny. He would, uh, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but I will. <laughs> he, he would come and stay at my house, but all his mates were staying around Snapper and, uh, you know, he'd be like, is it okay if I go out tonight? I'm like, yeah, just let me know when you're home and or let me know if you are coming home or staying out. And uh, one night he's like, oh, I'm gonna stay out, is that okay? Be, no problem. And I caught him sneaking in the back gate, like doing the wow. sun run at like seven o'clock. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That's pretty but classic, I will say. Uh, I saw Sorry. a few clips of Jet dripping the lower left, doing these like crazy, beautiful, like sweeping hooks. And Biolis was like, "Yeah, he's been learning from Nick. He's been paying attention." Yeah, his yeah, it's style. been That's fun. Been... Yeah, he's he's been uh, he's been going so good. He he's awesome. He'll he sat down and he's like, "What do I do here? What do I do there?" And just and he'll send send us clips and be like. What do you think about this? What can I do different? He was, um, he, he's such a good little student. I, I really love, 
like just sending him little props here and there and um, yeah he, he's such a fun little dude too he's so big how about this is that's about how good my golf is still <laughs> Uh, after this clip's done uh, rolling, you're, I, I want to hear the story about Rosie Hodge giving Kelly shit about his speech during that. <laughs> yeah, um, that was pretty funny actually. She just called him out. Yep, it's not your night, Kelly. He was going on, going on a uh, bit of a tangent. And she's like, it's not your night, mate. Just settle down. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, I remember, Mick, we were trying to get you on this uh, little AI mission here last year. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was like, going to come. Spotlight. I was really close on coming. Yeah, I was going to come, and then last minute something popped up that I couldn't do it, and I, I was sort of bummed. This was pretty cool last year, the, the fight for the bite, and then Kelly and Aki's Bell's uh, Swellian podcast, that's what's coming up right here. Uh, it's got to feel good in Australia to feel like uh, some grassroots movement is uh, making some difference over there. Yeah, that was incredible. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was so good to see the whole community, not only surfers, but all people that use the ocean, uh, come together and and co collectively fight, you know, one of the big oil merchants of uh, the world. And, um, you know, a lot of props go out to the guys that were on the ground, you know, Fight for the Bite guys, um, Heath Josky, Sean Doherty, um, and, yeah, there's so many more, but it was, it was awesome. I, I, it was, you know, I was sort of just showing up and showing support where I did, where I could and, um, but the collective group did such an amazing job and um, it's good to see that people power can still win in these, in these times. Yeah, that's your ad. This is the, uh, the West Oz app. Uh, I'd never surfed this way before this session and this was in between the day, the last day at Mark River and one of the days at Boss last year that was psycho. And, I'm sure you guys all know which wave this is, but fuck, that's a fun wave. <laughs> Sorry for cursing. A trip. Uh, Mick, when how was the last time you were in? I was going to ask Nate when he was last in WA. Um... I was there. The last time I was there was with one of the events. Um, I think it was the last time John won over there. I believe. I'm not sure, but. I love West Oz. I've been there a few times, and just the span of that many different waves in such a short area, it's almost like the, how the North Shore is. You have every different wave you could wish for. You have air waves and slabs and bear waves and ripping waves all in one condensed area. I was like, oh my gosh. I have, the one thing is I haven't been back since air camp started, so I think my main for air camp graduation should end in West Oz. Yeah, the so finals are at Cobble. You need a wild card. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. That was one of my yeah. favorite. Ian is a coach. Which is, which is, I can't coach. One I can't go. One of my favorite podcasts with John talking about that air in France against him. Oh, it was so funny because Parker was in that heat too. And so me and Joel were actually just – just making sh sh we were sort of like oh well we're going to get second anyway so we just didn't want to get third uh, and, and i started getting all fired up and then i went for that air and i i, I like closed my eyes and opened and i was still there and i was like wow i made one so <laughs> and, then, and then john got all fired up and just goes and busts a massive one i was like are you kidding mate like, oh, great. let an old boy win something yeah. yeah, and then he didn't talk about the next heat where he absolutely comboed me to shit. It was uh, it was pretty embarrassing on my part. <laughs> um, Nate, were you on all those West Oz trips for uh, View from a Blue Moon with Albie and Matt and those guys? Is that did you run that trip? Um, no, no, I wasn't on those trips. Um, at that point, I was kind of just doing a lot of different stuff. They, I was chasing more. 
I was chasing Tahiti a lot and trying to get that, that stuff down and just kind of breaching into the big wave stuff. So those guys were like, let's go do full rotations and try and progress aerial surfing as much as we can. And I was like, you guys have fun with that stuff. It's lame. I'm going to go get barreled. <laughs> and now, now it's, I'm the guy like, screw those barrels. I want to learn how to do an air reverse. Um, so I believe this time last year, was it around this time last year that was uh, Cape Fear? We were trying to figure out what the schedule was last year because I know that it was around the time for Bali, right? For Shippy's name? It would have been close. I don't even remember. I was in such a travel nightmare leading up to that event. I was on my way to the Galapagos and got stuck in Houston because of thunderstorms, missed more flights and ended up staying there for three days and then turned around because they called Cape Fear on and flew from Houston to home for eight hours, got on a flight to Tasmania. <laughs> I was like, I'm here to party. Let's go. <laughs> Had you surfed shippies before? Once when I was like, so I went on this insane trip when I was like 15 and it was really before I had any big wave experience at all, besides like a little bit out of reef stuff at home. And it was with the Godowskis filming for a Vans film. And we ended up just absolutely scoring. They scored um, ours or Cape Fear. I don't know, it has a lot of names, but it. I was like terrified. I didn't get a wave out there. and. And then they're like, let's chase it down the ship turns. And I was like, great, I'm on this trip with like these these guys just chasing slabs. And Mark Matthews ended up linking up with us. And he was like, I don't care what you say, I'm gonna get you into a bomb at ship turns. And I was like a 15 year old, like, please don't, like, I don't want this. And he's like, threw me the robe and I just couldn't say no. And all the guys down there were, were so supportive. They were like, you're gonna get one, get you one. I had two huge wipeouts and one make and i was like that's it i'm going all in the big waves like this is what i want to do so it was kind of an epic trip like my first time ship turns was a turning point for me in my surf career i feel like well right. that contest has to feel like a little bit of a turning point in your career too yeah that was to date the biggest uh, competitive win in my career and i couldn't have been more happy that it was that event with the people down there and and I'm just psyching for it, but very, very scared for this next year because I know the boys want it to be huge this year. And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, you got to give credit to Mark. Cool for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to give credit to Mark and the Red Bull crew for that contest. I do feel like whenever it runs, it's like the greatest demolition derby of surfing ever. 100%. I think one of the one of the most exciting events to watch um, in surfing period, especially the first year they ran it. That was like, and anyone will agree that that was the most insane viewing out of any surf event period. I think so, at least. I mean, I was glued to the screen. I literally thought someone was going to die while I was watching. And these guys would not quit. Didn't matter. They had like the org the organizers had to call the event off because the Astros were like, let's keep going. I was like, geez, animals. Yeah, those guys are psychos. I just remember seeing the footage of all the guys in Fiji watching the contest around the bar. Were you at that uh, you were, you were at that contest, right, Nick? I was, yeah. We were we was <laughs> I, w I was half in there, yeah. Um, that was the year that I was having half a year off. And um, they had just, they just put the contest in Fiji on hold for a week. And so we just, and it was Taj's retirement party too. So um, yeah, woke up each morning, cracked beers and uh, enjoyed nice. the show. It was incredible. It was incredible. Don't remember two, three, maybe four days of my life, but it was awesome. <laughs> That's insane. That's a good trip. Uh, Nate, we have a question for you. Uh, Josh Norcross wants to know what has been your most magic board of the last five years? Probably um, just the, the evolution of taking the Pizel next step um, and moving. Well, I was, because before I was on stretch boards and I was on quads. And I got on a next step and a thruster setup, and I, it, my surfing took off a lot on that. Just that little switchover helped me a ton. But I feel like the most progression I've had 
for cert in my surfing career has been on that next step model and just playing with the thickness and paddle power and, and all of that. But um, paddle is a close second, but I would say the next step has been my most used and favorite board uh, of the past 10 years. I frothed over a bunch of those boards when we were filming the pickup out back in Pizel's factory. He has like so many good, good wave boards in his lineup. It's like drool worthy. Yeah. You like walk in that shop, you're like, oh, all these boards were getting so barrel. Uh, from MD37, how much do you like kittens? All of the kittens. I'll have all of them and I want all of them. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> I'm a cat man. I don't care what people Are say. You? I love them. Nick, have you seen Have you seen Don't Fuck with Cats? <laughs> yeah, I was all fired up, and pissed off watching that. Heavy. That was Heavy. a freaky show, man. I was disturbed. If they ever do a second um, one, you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my freaking throwing knives out and go hunt that guy down. Um, so I think they have the Bali up, queued up next, but I was thinking that maybe we could jump to Brazil because Nick, as you and I talked about earlier, it's a great place to go out and party. And it was the first place that we met little Joao Chumba uh, last year. For anyone who Joao thinks is a that legend, he is a legend. Brazil, I think, might have been the most surprising place for me on tour last year as far as how absolutely epic it is to go and visit and spend time. Capital of Brazil. It's pretty wild, huh? European, African, Middle East. My, oh, my, first, my, first, my first year on tour was actually, um, the event in Brazil was actually in Sacarema. And at the time, just for that one event, the ASP back in the old WSL, they would actually give you cash instead of wiring it into your account. And Taj and I were in the final, Taj won, I got second. And then there was probably about, oh, I think we, we caught this bus and from Sacramento back to Rio. And we probably had about a hundred grand in cash on oh the bus. God. And we would, <laughs> The older boys were tripping out like Oki and Luke and you know, we pull up to this service station and I'm there with like 10, 15 grand of US cash in my pocket going to buy ice creams and stuff. I was like wow. 20 year old kid just trying to... and they got so angry at me. I've never been yelled at by them. And I was just like, they're like, get on the bus, we're out of here. And I'm like, I just want ice cream and then like, it's not the time for ice cream. <laughs> it's <was> incredible. <laughs> That's insane. Uh, I mean, I, I, I never really felt unsafe in Brazil. I felt like people were so friendly and like, I'm sure there's sketchy parts of Rio and different places, but when we were there for Sacarema, it was like a, a four-day holiday weekend. And I swear the whole town didn't stop partying for the entire weekend. 24 hours from Friday to Monday. And just in the streets, like chaos, but like totally like controlled and organized chaos. Yeah, yes, it's, it's um, um, Sakurima is like, you know, a cool surf town. It's, uh, it's super mellow. Um, and then you know, places like Florinopolis and stuff like that. I think it's, you know, the major cities that are the scariest ones. Um, but it's like anywhere. Um, you just got to be keep your wits about you and uh, just don't do anything stupid or walk down the wrong street. Yeah, and smile and say hi to people and be friendly and all the surfers don't look sketched they, out. People won't wonder why you look sketched out. Because <laughs> uh, this was pretty cool. I mean, I know you guys all use food wax, but. Uh, I didn't realize that the family still makes every single bar by hand uh, down in Sao Paulo. And still, we have like four cases of it over here that they just shipped us. And I swear it's still like contraband. Every time that someone walks in the office, they're like, holy crap. You guys have three cases of blue wax over there? It's gold. <laughs> 
So I don't use food wax, I use sex wax, I'm traditionalist, but um, I think it's something that you've got to be able to do airs to use it. Um, so mm. I'll just stick with sex wax. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm disqualified from that one. Nate's barely qualified. Is that first, <laughs> yeah, is that first prize for I'm air camp, I'm, Nate? I'm striving. Yeah, as a bar yeah. of a food wax cake. <laughs> I didn't realize that this wave got this good though. We surfed this day and it was like, it felt like surfing like small off the wall or something. Yeah, it's yeah, this crazy, is crazy. crazy right? I remember seeing this right here. And, yeah, being at home and I was like, I, if he didn't do that claim, I think he might've made that second section. But 100%. Um, <laughs> watching this footage and I was like, uh, John, I'm coming on the next trip to Brazil. The waves are going to be like that. Um, we asked this question on this episode, but uh, best barbecue in the world. You guys have all traveled far and wide. Brazil, South Africa, Europe, or I guess France would be the, the benchmark over there for America. Who makes the best barbecue? What we usually see in America is that each person has their own place. I don't know. I mean, it's I've had really good barbecue good in ride. South Africa. Yeah. Sorry, one at a time. Nate, you go. <laughs> I said South Africa. It's hard to beat that. And Nick said hard to beat a good bri. So we both agreed. Wow, Jordy Smith's going to be very excited to hear that. I, I would actually agree with you. <laughs> and I I do feel like it, there's something about how cheap it is and how much meat you get and how tired you are yeah. after surfing J-Bay all day. Yeah. I feel like that's the combination. <laughs> um, yeah, can Jordy cook a question? bar though? No, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> no, a bra's done on Carl's where <laughs> I just Jordy <laughs> uh, All right, we got a question for Nate. Nate, you were becoming a bit of a fit fitness influencer before quarantine. Are you keeping up on your fitness routine? Because people are starting to wonder. Yes, I am. So um, one fun thing I started is I was just, well, you get low, mo low motivation. Anytime I get low motivation, I put on this 20 pound weight vest and it looks like a bulletproof vest. So I kind of feel cool in it. And I'm like, I'm gonna do something badass in this vest. Like when I put it on. So my last five workouts have been with this vest on. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go two months every workout with this 20 pound weight vest on. So I've been on this crazy weight vest kick and it, it kind of forces you to obviously keep good form and keep everything clean, but it, it's forced me to do a lot more like a lot more running and cardiovascular work, which I do already, but um, I get really psyched on just working on that kind of stuff, endurance in your engine. And, and if you can add strength on top of that, then, then all the better. So yes, we've been hitting it hard still. Uh, I feel like I'm wearing a uh, 20 pound quarantine vest, but it's permanent and it's not very motivating, but uh... <laughs> you look like it. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. All right, speaking of, speaking of South African fries, uh, let's queue up the South Africa episode. So Mick, this, I think this episode was filmed about two weeks before you did your knee because Sam McIntosh was juggling whether or not he was going to fly in and just out in the dark or they were going to make me stay for like three weeks. And I was begging him to let me stay for three weeks. But uh, oh. how, where does J-Bay sit in your uh, in your heart of hearts now after being off tour? It's probably the one event that I'm just like, I've got to go back. And, you know, obviously last year being so close and, you know, being two hours away and then did my knee and then the boys got pumping J-Bay after I had to go home. Oh, I was just like... It's like breaking up with your first girlfriend. It was so heavy, so heavy. And I do feel like that period right after the contest leaves is, I mean, it's not uncrowded, but it's surprisingly not as crowded as you think. That like, there's like three weeks there. Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? The, the locals there are so cool. When the contests run in, they sort of don't surf it all that much. 
um, they sort of like, oh, we'll just we'll just give these guys their space, yeah. and then and then we'll have it. We've got it for the rest of the year. Um, and I don't know how they do that, but they do. <laughs> uh, but even then, all the local guys there are so cool, and the the guys that just really enjoy surfing the wave. Um, I actually got some messages during when they first got locked down in South Africa and Jay Bay was absolutely firing through those first couple of weeks of the COVID lockdown. And I was just like, how do you do that? How do you just sit there and just not go out? And some people got arrested for doing it, but maybe it's worth it. Yeah. We had like two days of Malibu being really good and people were losing their minds. And the same thing I saw, I think Jordy put up a clip about watching J Bay like eight foot and just firing. And I literally could not imagine not surfing. Like whatever the fine would be, like I'm sorry, I'm sure the public shaming would be terrible, but to be able to go surf J Bay at that size by yourself, like it's fine. I'll take Insane. it. <laughs> I'm sitting right yeah. You want at least two or three buddies though. <laughs> Just because the men in grass yeah. suits. <laughs> Body system. <laughs> Would you say that Jay Bay, I mean, I know that you're, you're, uh, you've got a right point very close to your heart right around the corner, but would you say that Jay Bay is, uh, it's got to be one of the top three best right points in the world? Yeah, 100%. Um, it, it's so different to other point breaks. Just the speed that you carry. Uh, and then just the lines that just show up. Like we have incredible points here, but they're all just that little bit different. And um, yeah, you, you remember that feeling, just seeing one of those waves, you just remember that feeling of like, you can go as fast as you possibly can and then just try and hold that line. It, it, there's no better feeling for me. Nate, when was the last time you surfed j -Bay? Uh, it's been, it's definitely been a few years, but um, we, we've been going to South Africa for a long time since we were real young and, and had the, uh, the luck to meet, what's his name, Frank Solomon down there and we've known him for a long time and when we first went over there, must have been like 12 or 13, he like kind of showed us, showed us a ton of Cape Town and then we drove down and, and scored J-Bay and, and went back for must have been five years in a row every year for a couple of weeks to spend time down there. So got really acquainted with the place and and I mean I, I just can't even believe I haven't been back there in in the, the amount of time that I have stayed away from it because the wave itself and the amount like I said with West Oz, the amount of diverse waves around the area as scary and spooky as it is to surf over there is just insane. That entire coastline up to the trans guys is insane. What do yeah. you think scary? West Oz or, or Africa? Ah, oh, man. I've honestly, I've ha had spookier sessions in, in Africa, I'd say. And the world's highest bungee jump over the beautiful Blue Crumbs River. I feel like the sharks are bigger in West Oz. South Africa. I see both of you. Then you get fitted. There's some big ones. Well, the last time we were there, people were getting literally eaten. The last time I was in West Oz was the time the two guys got bit in like two days and they called the contest off. That was the last time I was there actually, yeah. Uh, so, yeah so was... Guys are getting eaten over there. I was like, whoa. Have either of you guys done this stupid thing? <laughs> yes, and I'll never do it again. Oh, everybody was like, oh, it must do... have been the best day of your life. I was like, no, it's the worst day of my life. <laughs> I used to do it every year when I first started going there, and I'd do I'd You're jump two or three times. You're out of your times. mind. Yeah, and jump two or three times at the t the same time, and then I went and did it the last time, and I felt like the thing was slipping off my ankles, and it was gonna my shoes were gonna fall off. I was just oh terrified. my god! <laughs> I've been skydiving, and that bungee jump was a hundred times scarier blue skydiving out of the water seeing because you see the ground rushing up to you and you're like i'm that guy it's it broke already i'm not gonna get caught like <laughs> every time you think that i'm that one guy fuck here I go. and then the, and then the guy they... comes down and gets you and it feels like he's unlatching you and he's just gonna drop you but you like you've yeah, never cuddled like... a man 
so tight in your life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. <laughs> I was so scared. <laughs> All right. And they're uh, funny too. Know. They like, they kind of like, are like, I, when we went, they were, one of us was going and they're like, okay, go. And right as they jumped, they yelled, oh no. And I was like, why would you do yeah. that? Like he was totally fine, but they messed with you. And I was like, how, like that, why are you adding on to this? Oh, fully. We had a, we had a couple of guys and they're terrified of heights, but we made them go. And just as they'd gone to jump, the guys have grabbed them and held onto their harness. And so they're just suspended in midair, just looking down oh at for like God. a second or two, and then they let them go. <laughs> That's heavy. Absolutely not. That's the worst. Um, all right, Nathan, this is uh, this is your uh, starring episode here. Let's queue up the Tahiti episode. So I think I, I think I woke up my first morning in Tahiti to your voice at uh, Mama and Papa's. I was like, is that Nathan? And you and Daniel and Co <laughs> were standing up there. And I walked outside yeah, and I was yeah, like, you guys are like, like it's pumping. Can I like catch a ride? <laughs> We're like, you're nice to yeah, that's rad. I, so this was like your fifth or sixth trip to Tahiti, huh? Um, yeah, well, I've been going forever, but I had only been a few times during the event. Uh, I think I've been invited to the trials around three times, and this year was special because previously the trials had been, it was just tiny, and I just feel fortunate in being invited at all, and I'm always happy to go over there and surf it, but obviously you want it to be 10 foot and flexing like during those trials, just because the lineup of surfers is just all the top barrel riders. This year, with the swell, we were like, oh my god, it's going to be huge paddle. So we were absolutely psyching. And, and then we had that insane day. They didn't run the trials, but we all surfed all day anyway. So we were psyched. So if you look over my right shoulder, you can see the marina. I think that was probably the craziest session that I've ever witnessed in person, along the way personally, that day. And you get to the very end of the road, right at the river mouth. Yeah, being channel side out there is, um, it's so unique. Nowhere else in the world are you going to have a barrel so in your face. Where you, you're just sitting in the boats, you're going to be so close to the guys going on the waves and riding them and getting blown out of the barrel. You're literally getting spit on on the boats. Swells march in out of deep water and hit the uh, So you ended up doing a pretty amazing episode of your vlog out of one of these sessions where you broke down you time your heavy wipeout from this highlight reel in here. Bone dry reef. Uh, It'll send you into the dry what, what compelled you to, to break down like one of the more uh, unpleasant moments of your life? So I, I just saw a lot of people curious about it. They, they wanted to know what goes down and and from an outside view, it seemed like how, just how do you not die? But I mean, guys go through those wipeouts all the time and I just wanted to explain what it is like and what to kind of do and what I kind of try and do during a beat down like that. I mean, no matter what, you don't have control. You're gonna get taken and thrown where it's gonna take you. But um, I just thought it would be cool to explain to people what it's like getting planted on the bottom out there or going over the falls and or just eating it and knowing you're gonna get really worked. And um, it was kind of a cool turnout. I did a breakdown of the wipeout and why I thought I fell and what happened after and people were super stoked. So I was stoked. There's, there's something uh, very reassuring about teaching people how to fall right. Yeah, and the thing with falling right is it only, you have to fall a lot to fall, to learn to fall right. So there's only one way to practice. That was the way we were talking about What's right the, there. Yeah. What's the difference in violence, like the, between huge chopu versus huge jaws? Like, is it, so is jaws it's just a, more it's just like Mack truck? Or? Yeah. It's just on a way bigger scale. So like at chokes, you're getting in between those those violent boils, right? So your body's really getting torqued and pulled and crunched um, different ways. Whereas at Jaws, you feel like, you just feel how much bigger those boils are, right? So you're going in huge arcs and getting quick violent and then sent 20 feet down and then sent 20 feet to the side versus chokes being like, 
planted on the bottom, ripped up fast into the side, like in smaller movements, you know? So more of condensed violence, whereas Jaws is like just a larger playing field. You're moving so much more underwater, which makes it really scary because you have a 10 foot board strapped to you. And you're like, if this thing hits yeah. me, you're moving so much faster, you're like, I'm gonna get broken. If this thing touches me, it's coming off. So it's like a tranquil massage versus a uh, deep tissue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, sir. <laughs> The, the phrase condensed violence is absolutely perfect, Nathan. That's exactly how you describe Joker. What's Joker like? It's condensed violence. Condensed violence. And then Jaws is, uh, I don't know, released violence. <laughs> Throw it into the space. Bye. Yeah, I, could, I literally what, what could would have you What would you rather do? Jump in a UFC cage for five minutes or go out jaws without any flotation. Oh my God. I don't know. I feel yeah, like I, I might die either way. Right <laughs> That's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to defend myself, so a head kick might kill me. And jaws, I would probably drown without my little pool vest. Yeah, at least in the US, cage, you got oxygen. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Uh, can you talk about Lucas Jumbo real quick? This is the first time he's been in that event. Can you tell Lucas for a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so I was, just, I was just going to say that Lucas is super impressive um, out there because a lot of times your first trip there is, Chopes is one of the most intimidating waves in the world. You have a mountain of water coming at you and it's a really big swell before it hits the reef and then turns into like the condensed thick version that, of what it does. So just looking at a set is super, super intimidating. And I remember like going on what I thought was a big one my first trip there and it was a four footer when I viewed it from the channel. Whereas like, so you know to go on one of those sets, you're looking at one of those mountains and Lucas paddled out there and he was like, I'm not going on any of these little ones. Like I'm going on the first set I see. And he took a massive beat down, which again, your first time there, you're like, I'm gonna take a breather on the boat. He was just psyching. He paddled straight back out and he just had a killer session. He went on every big wave that came towards him. And he didn't, it wasn't just going on anything, but he was performing out there. So he was like learning very, very quickly the way that wave works and, and surfing it super, super well. His bail riding was insane out there, which I thought was cool to see because a lot of times people's first trip there is mostly sitting on the side or not getting waves up, sitting out the back, but not going on waves. That was I can second, second that from experience. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, who's the best person you've ever seen out at Chopes in your mind? Who stands out to you? Oh. Probably um, Manuel Drillet. Um just how calm he is and just how relaxed he is. Like, you think he's just trimming Waikiki on a longboard, you know, he's just so mellow. Um, he, he's, yeah, in those huge situations, he's just so calm. Um, those local guys are just next level though. They're just, they're just so ready for that. And uh, especially when he gets in those toe days, they, they're like, oh yeah, everyone else is sort of like hanging on and this and that. Those guys are just like, yeah, yeah I'll go for the soul arch in the wrongest spot ever, but I'll still get the shot. They're, they're incredible. Totally. Yeah, I, Nathan, you I know agree that. with that. Those local guys, they have, yeah, they have such a wave knowledge down there and such a comfortability out there that like Mick said, most guys are hanging on for dear life and they're throwing double arm stalls. Manoa surfs with a hat on. He's not worried about much. He's, he knows the wave he wants. He knows he's going to make it. And he surfs it better than, than anyone that will. Until Matahi came along, and he's now becoming that guy. I mean, he, we've all seen the waves he's made that he should have been way too deep on. But the wave knowledge they have out there, I mean, the amount of practice they put into, you know, they, they just put in t the time, and they have it there in their front yard, and they get it so damn wired. It's, it's impressive. 
I'm glad that you brought up Atahi because I did feel like we need to mention some names from Tahiti, mainly Emu, who was like 15 last year, who had a hell of a Hawaiian season. Tariva Davis, insane who's a legend. Yeah. Uh, and then Matahi, I feel like you and Matahi are now the like front runners for best wave ever ridden at Chokes. Yeah, it's fun because it's that backside frontside battle. So I'm just hoping uh, Emio doesn't keep pushing the way he's pushing because then he's going to take the backside wave title. <laughs> if a front, Koa and Matahi can battle all they want frontside, that's for them. I'd what do you think? Is the, you, think an, you think frontside or backside is an advantage or disadvantage out there? I mean, you guys are both regular footers. I think backside is an advantage personally because you don't have to extend on that drop. Um, you're already tucked and you get up and one hand leaves the rail, the other stays on it. You know, you, you can stay condensed, but those front side guys have to deal with extending out on some of those drops, which I find terrifying. Um, and you see a lot of the drops Matahi does. He's catching air and free falling. Same with Koa. Um, I feel like they have, to, they have to deal with a harder drop front side. Um, and they're pushing it just as hard as anyone is backside. So it's just gnarly. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much the same there. I, I, uh, but in saying that, I think the, the way that the goofy footers can race inside the barrel, um, you know, guys like Matai, Owen Wright, the way that those guys can move in the barrel it, is just incredible. I'd love to be able to do that on your forehand, but um, I guess you have to find a right and really test it out, a right exactly the same as yeah. Chopes and give it a go. But um, look, I think it's just whatever you brought up doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think just for time's sake that we should probably get into the Europe episode. Uh, we're going to skip over the ISA games in Japan, although they were radical. Uh, it was like the first time I'd seen sort of the, like the nationalistic pride at a surf contest and with all the CT guys there trying to qualify for the Olympics and having to surf on teams together, you know, Kelly and Kolohe having to, you know, surf together was pretty entertaining. But uh, let's get into the uh, Europe episode real quick. So this is France and Portugal. Uh, so both of you guys have spent quite a bit of time in Europe for different reasons. Nathan, you've spent a lot of time there for the Nazare contest, and Nick, you've been going there for ever. Uh, Portugal or France? They're very different. Um, you know, when we first started, when I first started going there, um, I totally preferred um, France over over Portugal, um, just due to the fact like the Graviers, it's such a dream wave. And then um, I I really like the food and the wine and um, and then also just the culture in France. But then as time grew on and the more I got to experience Portugal, there was so many amazing things about Portugal that were just like the. The food there is incredible. The wine's incredible. The, their culture is so much different. Um, so it's sort of comparing <laughs> apples and oranges in the fact that they're so different, but they're both such incredible places. Um, Portugal probably has a little bit more variety in the wave sense, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not gonna say which one's better. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. Uh, have both of you guys been to this restaurant right here to Shea Menus? This is Shea Menus? Yes. This is the place that I Very much so. My, one of my favorite ever, I think. A bowl, the, the big bowl of mussels and a big bowl of french fries. Every single time I've been to France, I've gone to this restaurant with my family. It's a ritual, it's a must do. Some of the best aerialists in the world. How about you, Nick? Yeah, been there. Uh, love it, love it. Um, there's a, I used to go to this, there was this other restaurant that I used to go to and I, I went there like 14 days in a row out of, out of 20 <laughs> and they served this duck that was just incredible. I love, I love duck and that's pretty much all I eat in France. So I start quacking by the end of the three weeks that we're there. 
<laughs> so this was Red Bull Airborne last year, which was pretty cool to see the way that Red Bull and, and Kersey and those guys were able to integrate the score into the CT. And I think this particular day ended up being sort of the highlight of the France event for a lot of people. Uh, but for us and for staff and for the whole Go Contest crew, having Prana win, who is like one of our dear friends, and having the car meet, we rented a uh, apartment right above Backlaw, like right off the beach of the draw on that second floor above the plaza. <laughs> That's insane. And we threw a party for Prano that pretty much lasted for like three days because the contest got called wow. off right after that. Uh, and... Yeah, there's a lot of people sleeping on the couches. And it's, yeah, it was one of the better, the better little runs for the crew. <laughs> How could you ever sleep in La Centro there? <laughs> it's, <laughs> during that the time, it's just mayhem the whole time. No, I'm not really sorry. It was. I thought we were going to die. If we had stayed in France like two more days, I think we all would have died. Perished. I mean, you got to think about that whole airborne crew being in town after the event and they're not being waves. It was like the trouble. Uh, yeah. Have you, you guys done down the, the Cafe de Paris? Once or twice, maybe four or five times, actually. <laughs> Good man. Uh, so can you guys give a little spiel about Portugal? I feel like people don't realize how close all of the sort of zones that people think of are, as far as Benish, Aristera, and Nazare. So personally, I yeah, think um, Mick would probably better answer this. I, I haven't been as much to Portugal, but I've just been to Nazare and I've been to the event spot, so Mick, take it away. Yeah, um, look, there's so many waves, and especially because the roads are so good, you can get to places really, really quick. Um, and yeah, like Peniche is sort of like in the middle, and then you've got Nazare to the north, and then you've got like Irisira area, and then into Lisbon as well. And there's just, there's everything from beaches to slabs to obviously Nazare. There's such a wide range. In, um, you know, I guess people are sort of seeing what Nick Von Rupp's been chasing in his episodes that have been going out, Von Froth. Like the waves there are just incredible. And um, so, yeah, I, it's it's always an exciting place. And you're, if you're going to go there, spend a bit of time so you get a bit of everything. Yeah, I feel like Portugal is one of those places that you could definitely spend a few months uh, and score all the way from the north to south down to the Algarve uh, and enjoy yourself along the way for a very affordable amount of money. Like there in South Africa are probably the cheapest places on tour. Yeah, and make sure you end your trip up in Porto. Porto is incredible. It's uh, such a fun city and the wine country just out the back in the Douro Valley is to die for. <laughs> That's some, that's some quality of life up there, for sure. I think I put on like five kilos last time I was there. <laughs> that's sick. <laughs> just, just pork and sardines and, and good cheese and bread. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, everything but the sardines, mate. You can keep those. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Dude, I feel like they give you power, Nate. I love sardines. I love anchovies too, though. I think it's just preference. Put them on my pizza. Me and my cat eat them. <laughs> <laughs> you are a cat guy. Uh, you do like the right, lady in the tram style, huh? <laughs> With the cat. <laughs> uh, we've, we've got a few comments here. Uh, Ella Steiner says, Nate, grow a mohawk in quarantine. Uh, she also asks, if seasons are split between QS and CT in 2020, what happens to the Vans Triple Crown? Which seems like none of us are qualified to answer that question. No idea. Uh, when, when's the return of Air Camp, Nate? Air Camp lives on. It's every day. We have, we have east winds every day here, so I continue 
my backside air practice and I continue to not get to work on my frontside air practice while Ivan starts air camp six months late and blows me out of the water in the first month. I don't know if you guys have seen, but Ivan the last, this winter in the last six months, I think he's become my favorite surfer style wise and just progression period. Did either of you grow up skateboarding at all? We all grew up skateboarding. We had a ramp in the backyard and me, John and Ivan kind of were equally into it. But um, as John stopped skating because he was very seriously into the tour and it was just a injury prone sport that he didn't need to have. And I think he got a lot of um, use out of it from his younger days as far as the carryover into surfing. Ivan, however, is just an animal I and mean, he's not afraid of concrete. He still skates to this day, and he rips skating. He's really, really, really good. I just straight fear concrete. I can't handle slamming on it anymore. I'm over it. If I, I, I have, I risk it all out in the water and and use up my nine lives, and I don't want to waste it at the skate park. How about you, Mick? Do you I'm go sorry, skateboard my... at all? Uh, I I did a little bit as a little kid, um, but then yeah. I learned very early on, probably I was about eight or nine, that skateboarding really hurts. So I, I remember the one time I went down a big hill just around home and I sprained my wrist and I wasn't able to surf for a week or two. And that was it. I pretty much threw my skateboard away. Yeah, I feel like that, those are the defining moments is if you get hurt and you can't surf, if you do it again, then you're into skateboarding. If not, you're a surfer. No question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will say that your brother uh, is constantly in the conversation about the uh, best crossover skater surfer on the planet. And it's always between him, Kalani David, Eric Geiselman, and Kern Caples. Uh, and I feel like that's a pretty yeah. epic conversation to be a part of for him. Totally. Super rad. And, I'm, and snowboarding, too. All those guys are talented snowboarders. There needs to be some so kind I of tri tri sport event. So did, did you and your mother and the, the brothers at some point sit down and decide which like sort of discipline each three of you were going to fit into so there was no overlap? You've got your brother who's like the world <laughs> champ right? prodigy. You're Mr. Big Wave guy and like slab chaser. And your brother is like the unique sort of introverted crossover athlete. Uh, I think this natural progression just, just split roots, went different directions. It's epic. And you guys don't have to like compete yeah. with each other anymore. You can all do your own thing. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty nice. <laughs> well, like John's is on such another level. Like we, me and I were like, there's no competition there. Like <laughs> we're going our own way. <laughs> there's no chasing after that guy. Well, speaking of that, I think our last highlight really got here is from the Hawaii episodes over the last five seasons. If you want to cue those up. Uh, Nate, how would you compare this year's Hawaii season to previous years? I feel like the Jaws contest and a few other, you know, good type day, the world title coming down for the last day of finals day. Uh, Insane. Rating. I mean, it, yeah, as good of a winter as you could want. We had consistent Jaws. The waves were actually insane for the Jaws event. We had multiple outer reef swells. We had multiple crazy pipe runs, like not just pipe swells, but but week-long runs of waves, super consistent. And I want to say, at one point in the winter, it's some of the best sunset point I've ever seen, which is kind of a rarity. I think it, I've never seen it so sick where guys were getting that many turns in and huge barrels and all that. So we kind of had rad. Every different world-class spot had its day this winter. Um, so it was super rad. For all the people coming in, the events, and just all the local boys at home were firing up. Uh, what was your most memorable session of the winter? Can you uh, think of what stands out for you? I think for me, it was the Jaws event. There was just, we knew it was going to be big. There was so much hype for us and we were so excited to, to get over there and do that. And so nervous. There was such a buildup to that swell as well, because in the beginning, it looked like it was going to be similar to the year before where they called it off. And they were like, if it's that size, we're not calling it off because of the backlash and so forth like we're gonna we're gonna send it in that in those conditions and so we thought it was gonna be like that and 
there was just a ton of hype and then comp day ended up being absolutely perfect for an event paddle guys are pushing the limits and for me that was that was the best big wave sessions I've had. So I was I was just super stoked to get third in the event and, and have that day out there. Nick, did you make it to Sorry. I didn't did know. I, I didn't know. I, um, I stayed home because I was injured. So I just watched all at home. Um, but yeah, it was very entertaining. Um, we we luckily had nothing out here, but it was great to watch from afar. But I had a question for Nate. Like with these weeks, like last year, you had like you'd go from Jaws to Pipe, back to Jaws, back to Pipe. Like, how's the your adrenaline's at you know twelve fifteen out of ten for like yeah. a week or so? How's the come down after that? Like, do you have to just like? Put yourself in a dark room and zen out for a week or so, or you just like, it's nah, so I'm bad. still going, I'm it's, going nuts. No, it's like you, like you said, we'll we'll have a big pipe day, jump on a plane, land 10 p.m., go to sleep, wake up 5 a.m., surf jaws all day, fly back that night, surf pipe again the next day, and after a three day like that, you're just absolutely spent. Your adrenal system's completely done. You can't get excited to do anything. You're like in a borderline depressive state for like, I find working out helps bring me back, but for sure, like ask any one of the big, the big wave guys, they're like, you are down, down. And if, if you don't start moving again, getting out, like you'll be down for a week. You just can't get, can't get motivation. You're, you can't get adrenaline or hype or anything to go outside and do anything. Like you just spent it all, you know? So it's a real trippy feeling, but there's ways to like, fight it and come back. That's all time. I guess people never really, I imagine it's similar never really to like, think about like that. I talk, yeah, I talked to John about after his first world title win and like after you guys win a tur world title, all that entire year of the stress of every single event and competing every three weeks and then the title comes around and it happens and it's done and, and the goal is done, you've achieved it and there's just that. I'd imagine there's a big come down off that as well. Yeah, it's a, huge, it's a huge come down, especially after parties when you're hungover for a week. <laughs> oh, on top of it all, a hangover. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's yeah, like that. It's sort of a different thing. You've got to really manage yourself throughout the year um, for the spikes and the and the come downs, and make sure that you you're really listening to your body. But you know, we're lucky enough. Like over Christmas time, when we come home it's our worst time of the year so we don't really surf but like for someone like john it's like pipe's still firing or you know why me is on or all these waves i always trip out like how do they how do the, someone like him or carissa moore as we see here keep surfing through that time i'll just be spent yeah hectic <clears throat> Am I right in thinking that this year that Billy had to surf in the Pipe Masters and then fly to Maui, win Jaws, and then fly back for the next heat at the Pipe Masters? Was that, am I, am I Billy won the trials, flew to Jaws, yes. won Jaws, and then flew back and surfed his Pipe Masters heat. What an animal. Oh my God. Yeah. Talk about a heater. And just before that, he did he win Sunset? I forgot. He had a crazy year. The guy's a bulldog. Uh, Do you reckon he's the most intense? The... Most intense? Yeah. I mean, yeah, like as far as keeping focus and intensity, yeah, like an incredible competitor. The guy is the the motivation for him is through the roof, and the ability to stay focused and not let things distract him uh, is inspiring. I find that I get easily distracted, especially before events, but. But Billy has his routine. He's uh, super OCD about it. He has his diet down, his training down, and nothing's out of place before his event time, you know? So he's he's definitely a world-class competitor. I think for a while there, you and him were uh, sort of in a neck-and-neck -neck contest for who was doing a better job of exercise and diet blogging. 
<laughs> and then pizza and burgers, my sushi came in. I was like, take your diet away. I eat mayonnaise. <laughs> so, uh, so what's next for you guys over the next few weeks? That's the, uh, that's the end of our highlight reel. Uh, I think that Red Bull's going to have the entire last five seasons of No Contest streaming for the next 24 hours on the, there'll be a playlist here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just what do you guys have going on the next few weeks? What's, uh, what's next for Mick and Nate? I'll just be cruising at home. Um, I'm continuing the, so John put out that series, the, the Vela it's called of that sailing trip. We talked about a little bit and, um, I'm putting out a series on my channel of the kind of day to day on the boat. So I'll be releasing those episodes over the next couple of weeks. And we have a ton of insane content to use on that and if anybody hasn't checked the vela on john's channel it's it's worth a check it came out really rad so we got waves home we're happy to be here and and relaxing usually we're traveling this time of year a lot so um take advantage of the rest and and just kind of wait till this all blows over how about you nick besides being the um, most prolific yeah. yeah i got about 45 million more podcasts to do with people. Um, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm sort of just cruising around. I'm sort of in a, in a holding phase until yeah, obviously COVID finishes, but in Australia, they've um, shut down the border. So you can't go from state to state. And as soon as they open that up, I want to go, I want to go surfing. I want to go and, uh, go camping and um, explore a bit of Australia while we can't fly anywhere. I've fun. heard a lot of people say that, that they were really excited about uh, being able to use this time to actually explore Australia, but that a lot of people had never actually taken the time to do those drives, which seem pretty like, uh, they're like a uh, requirement, you know? It's like, if you live in America, you got to drive across country at some point. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I, I was so excited. I was actually three days away from actually getting on the road, and I was going to drive from my house all the way down to Bells, do South Oz over to West Oz, and then um, oh, I was um, and, and, yeah, and then I was um, and, uh, uh, and if I was going to go and drive the top route back back around to home. So it would have been a, a really fun month or two trip. But um, yeah, at this stage, we might have to just do sectors, especially with the bub coming. I can't travel too far these days. <laughs> I think when we filmed the episode last year, we uh, that Be uh, Baron Hall Bez came and filmed that session with us, and he was just coming back from that year-long drive around Australia. Uh, did you get a chance to talk to him about some of his favorite spots along the way? I did. I peppered him um i was so intrigued and i was you know i was i was just about to start mapping out like exactly what i was going to do and i was just about to hit him up and get like the full star points but unfortunately hasn't happened now and um yeah but it will happen one day i'll be a uh, a gray nomad just cruising around australia <laughs> Recording your podcast in the back of a camper truck? Yeah. Just, just with the salty old fisherman on the, uh, on the edge <laughs> of each jetty. Well, thank you guys for doing this, man. This was fun. Uh, I know that for a lot of people, having the tour canceled is a pretty uh, devastating blow to their regular entertainment. So I think it's always uh, nice for to go back us. and see. Them. Of course, guys. And uh, thank you guys Thanks for uh, coming and doing with us whenever we call you up to uh, come and surf or drive us out to Chokes and hitch a ride with you. <laughs> yeah, we're still waiting for the paychecks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. All right. Thanks and uh, wish everyone all the best. Hope everyone's staying safe and uh, yeah, hopefully catch up in person before the end of the year if this all blows over soon and get some uh, great surfing going on again. Sounds right, good, guys. Yeah. Have a good right. one. Good to see you guys. Okay, bye now. <laughs> <laughs>